Hello, friends. Welcome to Pune International Center, an action-oriented think tank in public policy. I am Abhay Vaidya, Director PIC. We have a very exciting discussion today on India's emerging startup revolution, learnings from the Indus Valley Report 2022. Leading this discussion is Mr. Sajid Pai, Director Bloom Ventures, which promises to reimagine startup financing in India. We also have with us Mr. Alok Shirsagar, Senior Partner McKinsey and Member Pune International Center. What India needs most today is aggressive economic growth to address, to address a range of issues from national security to social disharmony to poverty and inclusivity. We are just about emerging from the pandemic and while the war in Ukraine is having its impact on the Indian and global economies, there is enormous hope and optimism from the world of digital economy and startups. Pune International Center's President Dr. Raghunath Mashelkar speaks of the opportunity for India to pole vault and not just leapfrog into the future with the help of technology and innovation. The other inspiring mantra that he shares with us frequently is what he calls Gandhian engineering, creating more from less for more. The world of startups is all about this. Let me now introduce our eminent speakers. Mr. Sajid Pai is a media executive turned venture capitalist. At Bloom, he leads investments in EdTech, HR tech, small and medium businesses, SaaS or cloud-based software delivery models, and B2B marketplaces. He is a prolific and popular writer on startups, e-commerce, culture, and education, and was LinkedIn's Top Voices 2020 for sharing insights from the intersection of technology, business, and culture. Thank you, Mr. Pai, for taking the time out for today's discussion. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. We are also delighted to have Mr. Alok Shirsagar as the chair for today's event. Mr. Shirsagar is a senior partner at McKinsey and member Pune International Center. He has deep experience in performance improvement and growth initiatives through McKinsey's London, New York, and India offices. He is currently the Asia leader for the people and organizational performance platform. And previously, he led the Asia Risk Management Practice and the McKinsey Asia Center. Mr. Shirsagar is very active on the CSR front and is the honorary president of the National Association for the Blind in Karnataka and on the boards of several non-profits, including the Wildlife Conservation Trust. In 2012, Mr. Shirsagar was recognized as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in view of his commitment to international business and public policy. Welcome, sir. I would like to mention briefly that Pune International Center is now in its 11th year and works in the areas of national security, energy, environment, and climate change, social innovation, urbanization and economic reforms, and the national innovation ecosystem. Last year, PIC published its book, Rising to the China Challenge, Winning Through Strategic Patience and Economic Growth. This book won an award and is available widely. Before I hand over the floor to Mr. Shersagar, I would like to mention that today's discussion has a Q&A segment, and you are welcome to post your questions in the question box. Over to you, Mr. Shersagar. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaidya, and thank you also uh, to Dr. Kelkar uh, for the very kind invitation uh, to do this. And I want to maybe say a word about Pune International Center for those uh, perhaps joining us who are not members. I am very inspired by the purpose and the passion by which uh, Dr. Mashelkar, Dr. Kelkar, and all of you have built the Pune International Center uh, as an action tank, as you say, uh, and uh, as an avid reader and participant in all of what you do, whether it's on national security, on innovation, on social causes, and now with this theme as well on what do we need to do around uh, the startup economics, culture and uh, innovation, I think is a remarkable contribution you all have already made. And I will say on behalf of Dr. Kelkar that uh, 
you also now have land and you're going to build a very exciting center that uh, all of us uh, should contribute to uh, as citizens uh, as citizens of our country uh, and create something uh, truly magical uh, in honor of uh, all that dr kelkar has achieved including of course as part of his 80th year celebrations that you all are holding uh, on to the topic of the day it's a great pleasure uh, to have a chance to listen uh, to sajit pai i've had a chance to uh, you know observe and read his materials over the years i think you'll find the discussion today will be very enriching uh, and i would like to suggest that um, sajit if you're okay we go quickly through the discussion itself so that we can really engage uh, in uh, q and a uh, and uh, one of the things i'd like to maybe put to you as a way to perhaps get this group uh, together is how do we move from startup to scale up and because in many respects there's perhaps too much of a focus on the startup india and not enough on scale up india and ultimately if we want to if we want to create grow growth and jobs in our country it will not come from millions of small startups it will come from many successful scale ups uh, so if you could perhaps address that and if i may suggest sajit you spend maybe 15 20 minutes on the overview of your uh, very exciting report uh, and then we have enough time for discussion uh, uh, from there so over to you sir great thank you for this alok uh, uh, thanks for setting the context uh, thanks mr vaidya and mr kelkar so what i'm going to do is uh, given that you said 15 minutes 15 17 minutes 20 minutes to can kind of just set the overview i have kind of summarized my report uh, and into maybe about 30 40 slides and i'll quickly go over them uh, the report is of course there online um, okay and uh, i'll also put it like i mean also share it with you so that they can share it in the chat uh, and so and then i suppose we could go on to a discussion so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to share my screen now and then we can quickly go over the report allow me to expand my screen can you all see it yeah okay so indus valley uh, the term indus valley uh, specifically uh, is a term that we coined sort of as a pun on silicon valley right but instead of using words like silicon uh, halli or silicon nagar we thought it be uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of a twist to kind of call it indus valley after our ancestral civilization and sort of keep the valley part not the silicon part so that's the reason for that so we prepared this presentation to sort of contextualize the rise of indus valley rise of startup india and to kind of take talk of what it means uh, and i hope this will be an annual uh, kind of uh, initiative every year uh, and this was the first one uh, the report is available at bit.ly/indusvalley2022 uh, all small caps uh the report which i've summarized here has three sections the first section looks at understanding india uh, and not through the usual uh, ways it, it tries to understand india through uh, and i'll come to it through data contradictions and ideas it looks at indus valley and tries to contextualize it then it looks at what happened last year uh okay so this is uh, sort of the structure of the report i'm going to quickly go into part 1 and every section in this really starts with this one uh, kind of india in one tweet and i love collecting these images which show all of the complexity chaos uh, the, the the grandeur of india the the madness and the method of india in, in, in it kind of comes together uh, there are at least three of them there this is one it talks looks at someone in bangalore uh, selling uh, a pens very cheap pens and it's collecting money through uh, gpa which is upi and talks about the most advanced payment system in the world and the most ancient method of selling where you actually sell in person uh, it's also uh, can uh, it's it, it, it's also a, a, a reflection of the power of upi in the country and upi today is actually very well poised to become the dominant uh, method of payment it's already overtaking credit and debit cards uh, okay as uh, okay uh, but it's now very quickly emerging as the dominant one uh, i'll go on to so the a few contradictions that kind of uh, kind of symbolize india and this is one chart which is very popular uh, where uh, lot of people were surprised by this that india actually has a very high proportion of its pilots as women like 1/8 of our pilots are women 
right? It's very high. Uh, whereas uh, a female labor participation rate is abysmal. Like uh, it's 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 really low, and uh, uh, it is something that's a concern, and there are many explanations for that. Uh, and a lot of India can be understood through uh, the prism of, uh, and and this is sort of uh, uh, the most important chart they say. But fundamentally, a lot of India can be understood as the addition of hundred hundred and fifty million people, thanks to Geo and uh, what geo engendered which is really democratized access to the internet through cheap mobile bandwidth uh, i'll come across this and dwell more on this but a lot of india's this thing can be understood through this chart i'm going to rush a little bit that said uh, it's important to understand that we are still users not consumers of the internet and this has implications for our startup economy as well as for the indian country uh compared to for example users the number of consumers are very low and uh, it's important to understand that there are only about 35 to 40 million credit card users in the country and there are only about 30 million households with cars uh, this is uh, low for a country of a billion and it's sort of the economic engine of the country rests on a very small part of the population and we come across what it means as well. Uh, I am uh, kind of moving fast. This you are welcome to kind of download this and reflect on some of these numbers. They're very interesting. Uh, this is important. This is extremely important. Uh, I'll come to how we have segmented the, uh, uh, the, the the population in in the next chart. But fundamentally, if you look, whatever data cuts you look at, uh, you'll, you'll you'll see that. The, the proportion of the economy, which we, dis, which we describe as middle class or affluent or whatever it is, is, is extremely small. Only about 10% of India's workforce has a permanent salary job, right? Uh, sort of, yeah, school fees, similar data, 13% of K-2 students. So this 10 to 15% in the consuming class is, 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 is important. And I dare say that what Alok referred to very smartly as scale up. Uh, a lot of it will have to do with this consuming class increasing. And I'll talk about, when, in, in our introduction, talk about the wall of consumption that Indian startups seem to hit. I'll talk about that. Uh, this is how uh, I kind of look at the Indian economy. A lot of people talk about 1.4 billion, you know, but fundamentally there are only about less than 10% of that who are, I would say, you know, what I call India one or the consuming class, people like us. Actually, people like us are in smaller proportion, but let's say it was about 110 million people who typically have a per capita income of around $10,000 average. So about a trillion dollar economy, which in fact, because of COVID has actually increased, the power has actually increased while the proportion is more or less the same. Then there's India too, which is a population that's come aboard, uh, you know, the internet, they're about roughly $3,000 per capita income. These are our drivers, our delivery boys, etc. I'd said oh, this is a very large world, uh, you know, which I call India 3. They're not really consumers of much of much anymore. So uh, one important point to notice, uh, we haven't got a lot of data, but COVID has been cruel to the middle and lower income classes, you know, the, the lower income classes. And we have seen a disproportionate jump in the incomes of the richest, rich, and the inequality has risen. As a result, the India, like this is 2019 to 21, the India one population has actually increased its share of the country's uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the consumption budget, really, so to say, or the, you know, and their per capita incomes have risen. And India three has actually got deteriorated a little bit. And so this is something that we need to kind of uh, keep in mind. Uh, and Again, this needs to be, this needs to hopefully, you know, it will get solved as uh, the post COVID we recover, but these are things to keep in mind. Uh, cognizant as of time, I'm going to just rush through. Uh, this is the third way of seeing India in terms of the ideas. And one of them we looked at is the, the three axes of advancement in India, English exams and exit. Uh, I'll dwell on this a little bit more. I'll go to the second section, which is understanding Indus Valley. Uh, 
So here I would say that uh, this is a one way to understand the rise of Bali through about four phases. And each phase has its own distinct characteristics. So uh, phase uh, one, uh, phase wave zero to wave one. Uh, wave one was really where we saw the rise of companies such as InfoEdge, et cetera, which today are the older vintage startups. And uh, they were marketplaces. They kind of introduced internet to India. Uh, wave three is really where the mobile uh, as a form factor rose. And, and, and mobile UIs became the main way for people to access internet. So there are distinct characteristics of each of these phases and there are distinct startups associated with this. Uh, and we are really in wave three uh, right now. Uh, one uh, interesting finding for us is how mainstreaming, of, uh, of main, I won't say it's become all the entirely mainstream as much as say, for example, the, the IT, ITS sector became, but it's getting there. One in every eight new companies is a startup in, in the technical definitions, not an SME. Uh, they, they, they are, they're not dwarves as, you know, they're, 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 they're just babies, you know, who have the potential to grow. Uh, about a tenth get funded of this. Uh, and that's the nature of the startup industry. Culturally, startups are becoming central. Like, for example, like, you know, uh, whether it's Zomato, whether it's Nike, uh, whether it's Shark Tank, they're all part of our uh, dinner table conversations. Uh, I'm moving a bit fast. In this section, what we've done is to look at three hero sectors. Uh, we looked at e-commerce, we looked at fintech, and we looked at SaaS. In this presentation, which is an abbreviated presentation, I'm only focusing on e-commerce. Uh, and because e-commerce is a great proxy for, for India's consumption growth, right? And uh, it's actually, um, if you look at uh, China, China is about a fourth of the retail market is e-commerce. Right, much uh, I mean, only South Korea is probably higher. Uh, U.S. is half of that, and India is about a quarter of the U.S. Thirty-three percent. It's 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 six percent, uh, and it's 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 doubled uh, thanks to COVID, uh, and thanks to also the retail economy shrinking. So it's about half of the U.S. and uh, sort of, I would say that one of the pleasant surprises has been the rise of shoppers from smaller cities in India. So it's not only concentrated in tier one cities and that has been pleasant to see. So to that extent, we are beginning to see commerce coming from uh, one uh, real challenge is the 70% share with Amazon and Flipkart. Very few other countries is there such dominance. Like if you go to Brazil, there isn't such dominance with, uh, there's no duopoly like this. Uh, this is important. And uh, I'm again repeating this, the economic engine it's a powerful but tiny engine. We've got to democratize this. Five million people can't drive 60% of all online sales in India. Uh, this is extremely uh, 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 important. And we, in the and all of us in the startup world are trying to kind of democratize this, but we seem to kind of hit a certain income wall. And that in, in a way becomes a consumption wall. And we're not seeing, for example, growth. For example, Zomato's challenges are fundamentally due with the fact that they're about stuck at 10 million regular users. They're not able to see that number grow. Uh, so this is one challenge. Flipkart similarly will be double of that. You know, uh, So the power of startup economy comes from this, that uh, out of the four of the top 10 and 10 of the top 20 retail brands are online native brands. And that to me came as a great surprise. Uh, won't dwell on all of this, but there are five important factors which drive the rise of Indus Valley. Uh, they're all listed here. Uh, one, there are two important uh, ones I want to dwell on, both on the, uh, uh, to your left. Uh, the term Wang traffic is something I coined when Tony Wang of Agora uh, told me that the Chinese economy took off when they had low, uh, you know, inexpensive mobile rates, mobile bandwidth rates. They had smartphones, uh, you know, in, in almost every, uh, with every person, and they had a frictionless payment system. Today, all of, uh, 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 I mean, we also have these advantages, but one challenge, uh, to be honest, is the Chinese per capita income is 5x of India. And if you go to the, the economic centers like Shanghai, Beijing, 
they're at they crossed OECD levels. They're at $30,000, $30, et cetera. And these are large 20, 25 million uh, urban conurbations. India, I think this is one huge challenge. Even if you take people like us, we're only at $10,000. There's only a few minority of us, like look at eight to 10 million households, which are at 3X this, $25,000. This is a real issue that we have to do, that even though these same conditions exist, unless the per capita incomes increase, we are not going to see Chinese level consumption, uh, uh, at least the next few years. It may happen after that. This one is something to be proud of, and this is incredible. Um, and a lot of the scale up possibilities perhaps come from here. Our bridges, our infrastructure are not shiny new like China's is, but our public digital infra is incredible. Like, you know, so that's cutting edge. And a lot of credit to the government, to uh, the public private partnerships, what Mr. Nilekini, for example, uh, and his uh, merry band of tech brothers went in and uh, tech brothers and sisters went in and did uh, what the government has been very open to in terms of having, for example, DigiLocker, which is again, you know, so we're beginning to have very bright minds come there, work with the government uh, on very high scale things. And there's some very interesting platforms emerging, okay? UPI we know, India Stack and Aadhaar, but these are becoming the base layers. Particularly exciting is the Beckon framework and ONDC. Uh, OSENS and uh, the account aggregator framework, is, which is, you could supercharge lending. Uh, then there are specific vertical public digital infra, like uh, GEM for the government using SWIM and education, all of these, but uh, specifically will take some time to come maybe, but OSEN and ONDC are very interesting and, uh, and, and they could potentially, they have the power to reshape parts of the Indian economy. Uh, lastly, and uh, I'll take about two, three minutes more, and then we could kind of go, just look back at 2021. Some of it is already dated because we are in May. Uh, it was an incredible year for the startup uh, ecosystem. Uh, tripled uh, funding, lots of money came in. Uh, I have this joke that, uh, you know, uh, that all of us uh, uh, sitting as venture capitalists, uh, all of us owe what we are doing our success to the US Fed. And I say that every morning we should get up as venture capitalists and do RT to Jerome Powell because what Mr. Powell and what the Fed gives is what we take it. And to tell you the truth, until that tap gets really turned off, we're not going to see any shortfall in this. There are very compelling reasons for that, uh, but this is this is sort of how I look at it. Uh, full credit to the Indian economy, but as much credit to the Fed. Uh, record number of unicorns, average time of unicorn has you know, gone up. But just an interesting comparison, uh, Israel, that 9 million population country, 35 unicorns to our country, which is like 150 times the size, population size and at 44. Wow, Israel, incredible. Yeah, no? uh, a few things uh, like uh, uh, the tech IPO took center stage uh, and uh, sort of... Uh, uh, I would say numbers you can see uh, one out of 16 became 10 out of 63, including some big names, which I mentioned, Zomato, Paytm, Nika, et cetera. From 2% of IPO proceeds, they account for a, over a third of the IPO proceeds. So this is how IPOs became center stage and they became like everyday talk. Uh, specifically, uh, EdTech, and this is important, uh, we looked, did a deep dive into EdTech. Uh, I'll go into uh, one of the challenges in edtech is the rise of like what happened with Amazon and Flipkart. It's kind of happening in edtech where but three, two to three upgrade editors and academy Baiju's are really becoming big and beginning to buy out a lot more companies. So uh, so scale up is happening, but in a very different way. Uh, very very important the digital divide that COVID engendered where. The rich got access to, uh, you know, a very good bandwidth, comfortable uh, environments to study from, but the poor have struggled. And there has been a learning gap that has emerged. Uh, those schools, in a way, have tried their best. Uh, only about 25% of the schools, of the 1.5 million schools, couldn't cope up. The rest could cope up. But still, what they've been able to do has not been on, the level playing field has not been there. Uh, and these are some findings of about half of children, for example, in class three, 
I've lost the ability to use subtraction, which is, uh, you know, these are not my studies. These are studies that Pratham did and Azim Primji University published. Uh, one interesting trend is that historically we've been seeing the rise of uh, uh, kind of private schools as a share, affordable private schools. Last year it dropped because of COVID. So what it means is the incomes have dropped sharply. And hence, despite the fact that government schools are second choice, we've actually seen a uh, kind of a migration towards them. This is a validation of the one that we're seeing in income divide. Uh, this is fine. I'll, I'll not dwell on it. Uh, this one I would like, given that there are a lot of bureaucrats, uh, there are a lot of thinkers here, there are a lot of policy wongs and policy makers and uh, enablers and influencers here. Be very careful because the talent that we're talking about, all of, uh, like I said, the economic engine is very small. Please keep in mind that the entire startup economy rests on 300 to 400 great founders who come in every year. For example, Vijay Shikhar Sharma, Ritesh, like the Bansal brothers, Bansal, uh, uh, Bansal duo. So, and I could give more. They are the visionaries who move and who lead from that seed stage, they bring it, make it big. If at the early stage, uh, if they kind of get uh, pushed to kind of go uh, and crypto is obviously a big sector, be very careful that the empires that could happen in India, the scale up that could happen in India will now happen in Dubai. And uh, this is one thing that we need to keep in mind uh, that uh, in what the emerging Web3 uh, sector, we are actually leading to our best and brightest founders all sitting in Dubai. And this is not good news. Uh, I won't dwell much on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are a few more slides. Uh, I don't think the rest are that important, uh, Alok. I think I've given them an overview. Uh, and I mean, the presentation is there. I'm very happy to answer questions, but uh, I think I'm done. Uh, I'm happy to pause here. And uh, you've given me 15 minutes. I know I exceeded that, my apologies, but here you go. Yeah. No, Sajid, thank you. Thank you very much. You're very insightful and uh, provocative as always, uh, Sajid. Uh, maybe just to kick the discussion off, I'm going to ask uh, three questions uh, yeah. to get a bit deeper into some of the points you made. And then I know there's already one question in the chat and would encourage uh, all yeah. participants uh, to engage. So I want to pick up on three things that in some respects are interrelated, but try and you know pull them apart in the implications. One is this very important point you made on user versus consumer. Right. So at the end of the day, we have 700 million internet users, but only 100 million that are consuming of any sort. And then even yeah. a small number believe that. So to what extent do you believe that whether it's the Oaken or the account aggregator or ONDC or other structural moves will increase that user to consumer base? Or is it going to come because you have a better penetration of edutech or health tech or other such skill-based uh, services. So I'm trying to distinguish between commerce or capability that will move those users to consumers. Question one. Um, question two, uh, relating to that, is uh, you know you mentioned this point that we are seeing two or three dominant players in every vertical, and this is something, of course, we've seen in China, we've seen in other countries as well. Uh, in your view, is that healthy or not uh, for our country? Uh, to end up in these situations. And question three for me uh, in the same context is what is the sort of capital we need uh, in order to be able to move these startups to scale up? Because my observation uh, is that uh, because of very short term private equity, venture capital or sovereign wealth compulsions, uh, they are often pushing companies into funding rounds into selling to each other or mark to marketing to each other because there's a race to have a supposed paper valuation which is not grounded in economic viability. And many of the IPO issues that you talked about have struggled because they don't know how to make money. Uh, and, and so what is the way in which we have a more sustainable, longer term capital to nurture these companies? And if I look at the great companies of India today, you know, if I look at the top 50, They've all gone through periods of ups and downs, but they were not governed by 
you know, uh, venture capital and private equity offer a three to five year time frame, looking to mark to market uh, for their own purposes, as opposed to the health of the company. So I just want you to unpack those three things, users to consumers. Yes. Uh, what do we do about two or three dominant in each? And how do we build a more healthy capital providing system, either within the country or outside, uh, that is not subject to this three to five year perception game? Yeah. Great questions. Uh, uh, thanks for asking them. And uh, important ones. The last one is the most important. Um, but let's take the first one, users versus consumers. Um, I think fundamentally, I think the user versus a consumer explanation is tied to the gravitational force exerted by low per capita incomes. Uh, the peculiarity of that is that the the, the, the most important uh, quality of, of the income is that the Indian average Indian person doesn't see regular income. And as a result, is not able to forecast his or her spends. Okay, for example, can do stuff like, for example, smooth and pay. Like, for example, uh, Uber can say, hey, uh, we're not able to kind of, uh, 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 what, sorry, uh, Uber can say that uh, what we can do is we can look at your last six months and we can tie up with someone who will give you like a salary equivalent product. So that even if one month you have 12 days lost to back pain, you're not able to drive, but your income doesn't fall below 25,000. You provided you can, you know, uh, take care of it. So Oaken, for example, has the ability to allow these kind of financial instruments to be built on top of it. Similar to how, for example, a small idli seller on Swiggy can actually get a loan while uh, Swiggy allowing a financial uh, a kind of lender to access the APIs. Uh, so my hope is that through data, through uh, like Oken, we can smoothen incomes and make incomes a little more regular. That would help hugely. Uh, the other one is that um, we are also, all of us in the startup world, are trying for new ways of in interactions. Like for example, all of the 53 uh, billion, almost like 90% of that is all of us clicking on uh, colored rectangles on flat screens, right, to buy. But that's not a UI that a person living in, let's say, small town in Bihar or, uh, you know, uh, or Chhattisgarh is used to. Uh, so for them, they may need voice commerce. And some of these are beginning to come. So my hope is over time, but if the per capita income doesn't rise significantly, uh, all of these will be good band-aids will, will, will catalyze, but will not dramatically change. But fundamentally it's to do with per capita incomes. And there are sp structural uh, uh, kind of interventions required there. The two to three dominant player point is valid. Um, I think there is some of the network effects part, which kind of make it a little more easier, for example, for larger players to uh, dominate. Then there's the fact that the funding typically goes to one person. There's a tendency to create a winner take all. Uh, I do feel that uh, we are beginning to kind of have a lot more uh, CCI uh, look at, for example, they started looking at big tech, uh, the Competition Commission of India. Uh, I, while I don't think there is anything untoward happening in the Indian case, it's just a question of some people getting lucky and becoming runaway winners. But I think it a check on these. And also, I think in some senses, venture capital does fund the underdog. Uh, we do fund people, for example, uh, who can take on this, uh, and, and, and that's there. Uh, so I don't think there's any easy answer, but I think over time, what you're likely to see is more, a little more regulation tightening, uh, a lot more upstart uh, founders coming and attacking these. Uh, so long as this continues, I don't think it's a big worry. But yes, uh, time to time, certain industries may get a little bit more concentrated, and you may need to kind of have laws which look at that. Lastly, the capital required, uh, which is, I think, the key question. So I do think the Indian startup ecosystem is very young, okay? And keep in mind that we're just, the, the, while I showed you 30 years, much of the growth has come in the last decade. The U.S. venture ecosystem is 50 years large, and it came of age when the capital markets, they were highly evolved. Whereas our capital markets were evolved, evolved only in the, only about five, six years before, because the NSC was set up, DSC, and it kind of evolved. And even now, our capital markets are not as evolved as the US. I feel that 
what we are seeing today in terms of questioning of profits, uh, governance concerns are good because uh, you know, uh, and historically, like you like he said, there are companies that have gone through ups and downs. There are shocks, uh, and then people use these shocks to kind of build armor, uh, kind of taking the right steps needed. So, Indian startup ecosystem is going through one. But all of us are questioning. Now, corporate governance becomes the most talked about point amongst us. Whenever I meet another fellow venture capitalist, we talk about the governance aspects, what we could do, etc. So I do feel that as these companies come into uh, listing, uh, we'll need to kind of support them. Bankers will need to kind of guide them. We'll start seeing a lot more late stage, intelligent capital come to support these guys. Uh, like for example, uh, maybe McKinsey will have to kind of uh, step in a little bit and see how we can advise some of these late stage companies going for an IPO. Uh, I think it'll take time, um, Alok. Uh, it won't happen fast, but over the next decade, I'm confident. At, and we already begin to see delivery, for example, is a very well-run company. Uh, you know, they have reduced the IPO price to make it palatable. We'll, we'll, there are lots of, like Razorpay, for example, is an exceptionally well-run company, profitable. You'll start seeing all of them come in uh, so startups come in all kinds, and uh, hopefully the attention, the questioning will, you know, lead to more and more, uh, kind of well thought through uh, sort of uh, moves. Yeah, I'll pause here. No, no, thank you, Sajit. Uh, I just my only comment on that last thing is I think part of the challenge is this idea of a unicorn based on paper valuation as opposed to real value, uh, yeah. and we're mixing up, you know, uh, mark to market or internal private equity marking up as opposed to saying what is the real economic viability of that company and how do we scale that up and perhaps even the media and all of us need to celebrate those with real users, real revenue, uh, as opposed to whether or not you're supposedly a unicorn. Now with that said, with that said, uh, let me open up to questions. I think there's some very thoughtful questions. Uh, three of them, I'm just going to read them out. Uh, uh, you can take a look as well, Sajid. The yeah. first of which is, which is, what do you think about the potential to export their services? The second, uh, Ganesh is asking, uh, I think the question we just raised, which is, what if 50% of them lose their horns? Because they uh -huh. don't make money. Uh, could be more than 50%, Ganesh. And the last point is um, also around the Fed. Uh, yeah. So all the artis you've done, you know, if they now switch around as they are five times this year, uh, yeah. what happens? So maybe you can take those and then we can take a next round. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, so uh, so I would say that uh, one of uh, I didn't talk about SaaS so this one. It's there in the uh, it's there in the larger deck, but uh, I think uh, the first uh, uh, wave of Indian startups which have come to fame and which are once are well known outside India are all what we call global SaaS startups. Zoho, Freshworks, Isertis, for example. Uh, you know, mine tickle out of Pune, you know, and uh, uh, Dhruva, all of those in Mobi, not in Mobi, but yeah. So I think, I, well, I don't have the specific number as of now, I can't recall. It's, uh, I don't know if it's there in the deck, but SaaS, for example, is a key pillar of the Indian startup. Uh, uh, it's actually the biggest sector. Uh, uh, it's a big, uh, it's, it's uh, FinTech and SaaS constitute the two big sectors. Third is EdTech perhaps. Uh, and I would say that even in Bloom funds, one third of our funding is to is global SaaS, which sell not services though, they sell products. And that's an important thing. So uh, I don't think they are anything like a TCS or Infosys, but they sell products. And some of these might be like a Mu Sigma fractal, which are like, uh, you know, pack kind of service product hybrids, but fundamentally these are products. And uh, I think, for example, uh, uh, some of these ones are almost hitting the $1 billion range, some of the bigger ones, uh, not like half a billion dollar to $1 billion range. I don't have an exact number, but I would say about, you can put it this way, a third of the funding, uh, a quarter to a third of the funding goes to uh, global SaaS startups in the Indian ecosystem. Perhaps that could be a good proxy, but I could try and dig, dig this number out as well. Yeah. The second question, yeah, so, uh, so Alok, uh, uh, I think you and Mr. Natarajan is asking a variant of the question. Uh, I think it's a fair question. So I wrote an article and when I came in, I was also very puzzled by how do we value, for example, we don't use DCF and all that. 
So I wrote an article, it's called Exhaust Fumes. And if you Google Sajid Pai Exhaust Fumes, uh, you'll get it. Exhaust Fumes because uh, a famous venture capitalist, Fred Wilson said, uh, venture valuations are the exhaust fumes of the money that you give, money, capital that you invest, and the state that you want. So it's very, so what we do is uh, simply put, uh, we cannot value a company which doesn't have predictable cash flows. So what we do is we use proxies, but we hope that as a startup gets more and more settled, as it gets more and more larger, cash flows emerge, predictable cash flows emerge, and then we can use the tools of DCF extra to value. Uh, to be fair with you, uh, what, a lot of what has happened has been thanks to the crazy COVID and the insane amount of money that Fed has pumped into the uh, Indian startup ecosystem, uh, in, into, into the world, and some of it finding its way into the startup ecosystem. So I would say last two, three years have been exceptional, but otherwise, if you look at it, it's a little more slower and saner. And yes, uh, there have been cases of startups losing their horns quicker, for example, Hike, I think. Uh, there are two startups which nobody talks about today. They were unicorns. And yes, this will happen. See, um, I'll be honest. Uh, all venture is built on high degree of failure. But it's been calculated that as many as 60% of all venture typically fails. Uh, 60 to 70% typically fails. So only about 30, 40% of it. Only about 10% do exceptionally well. So no doubt this will, some of, I don't think 50% will happen, but some of this will happen. And we shouldn't be surprised. This is the nature of uh, uh, Mr. Atle, uh, I do see some tightening, but one, so there was a wonderful paper by this gentleman called Michael Mobusan. Uh, he works with, uh, I think Morgan Stanley and uh, brings out really wonderful uh, papers. So he said that there are two big drivers. One is, of course, uh, the Fed. Uh, uh, the second is that U.S. pension funds need higher uh, uh, returns because uh, they are actually seeing more and more payouts. And they are now seeing that much of the returns are coming from tech. And hence the need for them to invest in tech. And uh, this is actually an important driver. And this is not going to go away. So while I see that, uh, for example, there will be some tightening, I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that the money that we get comes from large institutions. Uh, uh, okay, like sometimes our sovereign university endowments, large hospital endowments, etc., charitable endowments, etc. That money is typically given now is given for ten, like for a long period, three to four years. So you won't see something immediate, but over the next one two years you may see some tightening. But I don't think it'll be dramatic. I think India is secure. Also, don't forget China. As China gets more protectionist and more walled, India becomes a natural alternative. Which other large market is there? Turkey, not doing so well. Like, you know, India, Indonesia, Brazil has its challenges. Not bad, but has its challenges. So India, Indonesia become two big, large markets. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm reasonably confident we won't see much of a drop. Yeah. Should I cover the more questions? Alok, do you want to intervene? Do you want to get an option? No, no, please cover? go ahead. Why don't you cover the questions? I want to make sure everyone's question gets answered. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ms. Kiran's asked, uh, yeah. So, Gig is an interesting one. So, we calculated that we've created about 300 to 400,000 white collar jobs, startups, and about three to 3.5 million gig jobs. These are your Ola, Ola drivers, your Swiggy delivery, Zomato, Danzo, et cetera, right? Uh, even Urban Co, et cetera. Uh, there are two categories set. There is a semi-skilled uh, and uh, then there is unskilled. So delivery could be unskilled, I suppose. Uh, but uh, for example, if you are a beautician working with an Urban Co, I think you are in the semi-skilled category. Uh, I would say that uh, these are not what the questions that you've asked are very valid. These are not questions that the startup world worries about now. But yes, as they grow in larger, uh, they are beginning to look at these things. Skilling is becoming one big area. And there are startups now coming in to provide skilling to these folks. So for example, uh, 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 yeah, so non example, the too specific. But I would say that uh, we are beginning to see, for example, a shortage of delivery workers. Uh, and salaries will have to now go up. Uh, uh, 
because some of the delivery workers are kind of switching out, they're going back to whatever jobs that existed, etc. Uh, so yes, you're right. Skilling is not given much importance other than maybe one or two cases. Going forward, skilling will become an important area. Uh, but as of now, it's not. So I broadly agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Venugopalan, Mr. Venugopalan, how do you want to say? Yeah, so, so the, you raise an important point. So there are certain sectors which are important. But the fact is, uh, and this sort of related to what Alok said, are the nature of our industry, we, we are staged capital. So what it means when Bloom comes in, we come in very early, we provide capital for 12 to 15 to 18 months, and we want the Series A investor to come in and take on, which is why mark to market is a feature, not a bug. It's an inevitability of the fact that 15 to 18 months, I want somebody else to come in. We only provide funding for that. So the stage, uh, uh, st uh, stage financing cuts down risk because you, you make these people do these leaps, et cetera. So sectors which need a lot of lot, big long-term outlook, energy is one, defense is another, for example, uh, maybe some parts of healthcare. You need specialist vehicles. And uh, I don't think venture capital is necessarily the right, right one. We are very, um, uh, we are very geared towards B2B, global SaaS, consumer, et cetera. But with maybe some parts of healthcare, consumer healthcare. But energy, for example, uh, clean tech has been a challenge. Now we're looking at some aspects of that, but uh, there are challenges. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so perhaps, yeah. yeah. Last question, AI apps to take exposure to startups. So AIF is an alternate investment fund. Uh, I didn't get the question from Mr. Uh, um, okay, uh, got it. Yeah, so yeah, I think they're both routes. Uh, a lot of you who are experts in your own area, I think if, if you are able to afford the risk of investing in startups, knowing that the money could go to zero, I think a lot of you could mentor the founders and it's good to invest 10, it's not sometimes a lot of money, 10 to 20 lakhs you can invest. But some of you who don't, can't afford the time, take out time to do this mentoring, hands-on thing. And if you have large corpuses and AIS Bloom is one, there are many other good ones, okay? They become relevant. Uh, so you can invest one, two, two to three to five to 10 crore as much as you want. And but that money is locked in for 10 years. Huh? I do keep that in mind. And there's a risk of loss there also. So that I think would be like uh, my explanation. I hope uh, I, I was able to do justice to all the questions. Many good ones there. Yeah. No, thank you, Sajid. Maybe one comment uh, here uh, as we think about this. There's an aspect here which you talked about on staged capital. But I think, and it's a good feature of Bloom as a, as a firm, but the great investors stay with you through the long term. Yeah. And are not there just for the next uh, stage of funding. I think Bloom is a great example of that. And I yeah. might say that that, that that is one of the challenges we've had in the last three to five years because you have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sort of venture firms or private equity firms who have that very, don't have that mindset of staying with the founder through the ups and downs uh, that inevitably occur. So I think we do have a bit of a challenge here that, you know, we all are playing the IPL when actually this is a test match, right? To actually get, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, to actually get to uh, the success, and that score. When you ask the question about, you know, other sectors, right? Whether it's health tech, education, skill development, clean tech, all of these are things that create value over five or ten years, and so we do need to continue to create that patient capital uh, in in our ecosystem, enable our pension funds, EPFO, and others. To be able to fund that alongside with investors who are similarly able to take a long-term view uh, of that opportunity. Uh, let me just ask whether there are any other questions people would like uh, to ask. Please put them in the chat uh, as well. Otherwise, I might ask you one more question, uh, Sajid, which is uh, what in your view, going back to this very important insight you had on India 1 versus India 2, Right. So on India 2 itself, what can we do as a country to help them gain access to, you know, whether it's, as you said earlier, right, credit at an affordable rate because they're providing their transaction data or being part of larger ecosystems, whether in logistics or health or education uh, or, of course, in the e-commerce supply chain. 
But what are you seeing as good things people are doing to really make India two? India three is a separate set of issues, but your India two, the next two hundred million. Uh, what are some things to raise their income and obviously as a result the GDP of the country? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the smarter startups are trying to bring India to a board by structuring the pr pricing a little differently, the product differently. For example, pricing different. Harsh Chain of Dream Level said that they've got some traffic from India too by actually creating a ten rupee daily product as opposed to a 300 rupee monthly product. When you have a 300 rupee monthly product, uh, you get like one hundredth of the demand versus when you create 10 rupees daily, that same person does, you no. Know, uh, so if there were thousand, if there thousand customers for 300 rupees uh, a month, there are now 10,000 customers for the same thing, but split across different days. And so one way is to use smart pricing, sachet pricing, two, uh, one way, uh, for example, whether it's YouTube allowing uh, uh, downloads uh, or Amazon, for example, Amazon and Flipkart both tied up with retail stores to enable distribution. They had these, like Google having internet satis. So one way is to bring in this hybrid online offline element. And uh, because online, uh, for example, so there's a startup that I met yesterday, which trains people for radiology technician and jobs like that. They said they know that their students can't do online, not because of, uh, they, they said their houses are very small. They cannot sit and concentrate in those houses because they're living in challs, etc. So they have created these classrooms. So they're very clever. We need these kind of interventions, which reshape the product on uh, uh, the, I'm confident that, uh, uh, like for example, whether it's uh, education, for example, uh, it's historically being seen as an investment. So for example, buy now, pay later, and sort of these things expand. So credit is an important feature. And I think and the Oaken will actually transform the credit availability, the credit scoring, all of that to India too. And that to an extent is what I'm confident about. I'm also very confident that in the coming few years, we're going to see a manufacturing renaissance in India, led by certain structural forces. Uh, as the world deals with supply chains from China, we will see India emerge as a safe space. Vietnam, Indonesia, India will all emerge as safe spaces. And we are beginning to see a wave of startups uh, in the manufacturing tech space emerge from India. And uh, we are beginning to see uh, founders now, a lot more founders. So I think manufacturing is something that we're likely to see. And to some extent, manufacturing will help us that, that scale up, you know, that, that Alok spoke about. Uh, I think manufacturing is one sector which has one, you know, like we've been too dependent on services and manufacturing needs to come to our rescue as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sajid. Ganesh, you asked a question. I know it was tongue in cheek, uh, but I think it's uh, one question, one point I'd make to you just because I, I have the opportunity to lead our work with uh, startups globally is actually it's not about strategy because the strategy evolves very fast. It's about capabilities, the muscles. Uh, and this is a lot more about, for example, if you're a SaaS company, how do you build enterprise sales capabilities in the way Ganesh, you of course build brilliantly at Zensar and many others. It's about, you know, often uh, when you're building a large distributed team, uh, how are you going to manage leadership and culture when you're now suddenly moving from 1,000 people to 10,000 people uh, within 12 months? Or it's how do you drive uh, operations efficiency and productivity? So it's many of those functional skills uh, that are actually distinguishing those startups that are becoming scale-ups. The strategy will keep evolving, but it's the strength of your functional capabilities that are distinguishing it. And that's the other reason I just want to also call out to members of PIC, this plays to many of the strengths that you all bring, right? And therefore, even when you're mentoring a startup, you know, helping them build this organizational capability, help them build their operational capability, help them understand the policy environment and therefore what they can do to accelerate in the, in the, within the guardrails of that policy environment. These are the places the founders need help in many respects. Uh, they have brilliant ideas. Uh, the ideas and strategy is not the challenge, but the capability and the resilience uh, to deal with the cycles 
uh, through that is a challenge. I think the other questions we have, I think, covered uh, by the discussion itself. Um, and uh, I, you know, would suggest that uh, we, uh, now since we're at our time, I'll hand back to Mr. Vaidya. Uh, but let me just say, Sajid, uh, very thought-provoking, uh, very uh, sort of helpful way of framing the discussions, if I go back to summarizing this whole idea of the gap between users and consumers and how we make the next 300 million consumers is a big part of value creation. Second part you pointed out is our public digital infrastructure, the whole India stack and the opportunities that come off that now with healthcare, education and other skilling capability. And the third point we discussed is the nature and need for a healthier, longer term capital uh, for these so that we don't get stuck in three to five year cycles. Uh, and then we talked about the idea of building the capabilities and the muscle uh, to help these startups uh, become successful scale-ups. Sajid, thank you. Thank you also to PIC for the opportunity uh, to be on this. It's a wonderful privilege to be a member and encourage all of us uh, to apply. Uh, and then Mr. Vaidya, I will hand back to you uh, and thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shersagar. As you said, and as we saw from the comments, uh, uh, Mr. Sajid Pai's presentation has been highly appreciated. We had a comprehensive and intense uh, discussion, and I'm sure uh, our members and members of the audience will get in touch with you for uh, their replies to more of their queries. Uh, one of the important things that you said is that unless uh, per capita levels increase, uh, we won't reach Chinese levels. And that is uh, what really uh, uh, was what we emphasized in the opening uh, remarks itself that uh, our economy really needs to come to center stage. And the positive things that you said is uh, that the economy is growing and uh, there's a lot of optimism uh, in what we have in the future. Uh, so I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Sir Sagar, and I would like to thank uh, Mr. Shajit Pai. I would like to thank the members of our audience for attending this session and uh, for asking very interesting questions. Uh, before we close this session, I would like to give some information about our next event. Uh, this is uh, a talk by Professor Satish Devdar, Professor Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, on the role of gold in India from ancient times to modern economic policy. Uh, this will be on Saturday, 21st May at 12 noon. Uh, you are most welcome to register for this event on the PIC website, puneinternationalcenter.org. And uh, we look forward to your participation in this event. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you, sir.